Welcome to the F-Tier Nuzlocke, a challenge where I take what are considered the worst Pokemon and prove that one man's trash is all this man gets to use in his Nuzlocke. Today we'll be taking on Pokemon Fire Red. Using another tier list that YouTube recommended to me from fellow creator Chaotic Meatball, his list gives us quite a few options that seem really strong, but exciting lists nonetheless, and quite a few that I've never actually used in a playthrough before. And for those of you who voted on my last poll for Pokemon X or Y to be the next F-Tier Nuzlocke, don't you worry. I'm actually streaming that right here on YouTube if you want to see the run in its entirety. And after we finish streaming the run, the footage will be edited down like normal. But I thought this short challenge might tide us and the YouTube gods over in the meantime. If you like this video and want to see more challenges like it, make sure to like the video and leave a comment down below. It really does help, and I love being able to get your feedback. With all that being said, hardcore Nuzlocke rules apply. Let's run with it. We begin our journey like so many others, picking a starter we cannot use and running off from home like Peter Pan searching for an adrenaline rush. Fortunately, we don't have far to go before we find a Pokemon we can actually use and pick up a Weedle in Viridian Forest named Whitbeer. Thanks to the current level cap, we quickly evolve her into a Beedrill and that's kind of it. No more encounters for us for a while. And with the first gym being rock type, I feel like I'm starting to notice a pattern in these runs. Fortunately, Brock is a bit of a pushover. Whitbeer can set up six hardens to max out her defense, then poison the Geodude to poison sting and slowly chip away at its health with Fury Attack. Since Geodude doesn't actually know any rock type moves, we're still above half HP when Onyx comes in. A good sign, all things considered. Here, we abuse the AI a little bit. Onyx will use Rock Tomb until it knows Whitbeer is slower than it is. Weirdly, when an AI trainer has a speed dropping move, like Rock Tomb in this case, it is actually discouraged from using that move if it is faster than the opponent. That means with our plus six defense from earlier, we easily take two hits of Rock Tomb, are then slower than Onyx, and whittle its HP away the same way we did to Geodude without being at risk of Rock Tomb finishing us off. Eventually, Onyx succumbs to poison and we easily take our first gym badge. Up ahead on Route 3, we catch a Spearow. Spearow actually isn't allowed for this run, unlike my last one, but since three of our possible encounters are only available via trades, I'm allowing myself to catch the Pokemon necessary to trade as long as they never attack in battle. Which really isn't an issue, since our next challenge is Misty, who only carries a Star You and Star Me, and thanks to a lucky crit on one landed Twin Needle, we clear the fight in just two turns without taking any damage. I mean, alright, two badges complete. There's a rival fight waiting for us before we can move forward and cross Nugget Bridge, and this fight does seem a little tricky on paper. Our rival has four Pokemon against our one, and since I didn't think this far ahead, I actually accidentally gave him a fire type to use against our lone bug, so um, uh oh. Fortunately, we get a little lucky against his Pidgeotto, which only wants to lower our accuracy and land back to back three hit fury attacks to quickly take out the bird. Next up is Charmander, who we land another three hit fury attack against, one hit even landing a crit, and almost take him out outright. But he does survive and lands a nasty ember. Next turn, we are able to take out the lizard quickly with a poison sting, and Abra comes in next. A strange choice for his team since it only has teleport, but fortunately for me, AI sees teleport as a psychic type move and therefore super effective despite not dealing any damage. We take the opportunity to set up a few hardens, then KO the Abra with Twin Needle. Now Rattata comes in, can barely even scratch us with Quick Attack, and we win the fight with another Twin Needle. Ahead of us lies a gauntlet of trainers that actually proved to be quite the challenge, since I realized my level on Whitbeer was far too high, and if I fought all the trainers I actually had to, she would far and away level past the cap, and I wouldn't be able to continue using our only available Pokemon. That would effectively end the run right there. But we still had Spearow in the box, and I said I couldn't attack with it, but... I could definitely lead with it in battle and switch out right away, couldn't I? I mean, there's still risk involved with taking free hits by switching in and out, like this crit gust on Whitbeer that almost ended everything. So a lot of mandatory fights and switching later, we meet up with Bill, take on a few rocket grunts, and fight our way through to Vermilion City. Our first order of business is to barge into the home of this little girl and demand she trades birds with us. I can with full confidence say this is the first time I have ever used a Farfetch'd in a Fire Red run. And the adventure doesn't end there! Next, we hop aboard the SSN, raid the kitchen, pull out some old berries from the trash, and steal a great ball we find lying around before immediately running off. The Great Ball is actually really important because none of the Pokemarts I can currently access actually have anything better than a Pokeball. But with this, I can run back to Route 24, have a solid shot at catching an Abra, which I do on the first try. Look at that. Woohoo! Now I can run back to Vermilion through Diglett's Tunnel and pop up to trade with this boy who will graciously give me a Mr. Mime for my efforts. Now with a semblance of an actual team, we can reboard the SSN where we are once again challenged by our rival. Unfortunately for him, he has also underestimated the sheer power of Mr. Mime, who quickly two shots both his Pidgeotto and Raticate. When Kadabra comes out, we switch out to Farfetch to easily takes it out with Fury Attack and Knockoff, then switch ourselves back into Mr. Mime against Charmeleon, set up a quick light 
screen and two shot with confusion yet again. With the HM for cut in hand, we are free to challenge Lieutenant Surge, the next gym leader. Weirdly, I thought soundproof on Mr. Mime would protect him for Sonic Boom, but you know, apparently not. Still, we set up a light screen and KO Voltor with two uses of confusion. Then we get up a reflect before switching out to Whitbeer, who quickly takes out both Pikachu and then Raichu with a few quick twin needles to secure our third badge. It's also at this point I realized I can use the wonder of technology to change the names of the traded Pokemon, so meet Dunkle the Farfetched and Porter the Mr. Mime. Actually, as I'm writing this, I realize the names have probably been over on the right for a while now, but like, listen, there's a lot of steps to editing this and I can't always keep track of what goes when. Now we can struggle our way through Rock Tunnel because who in their right mind ever gets Flash and find ourselves an Onyx named Logger. Now we're left wound up in Celadon City, specifically in the game corner, where we can buy ourselves a Porygon who calls himself Doppelbach and frankly, I'm not going to question it. Continuing our blazing path through gym leaders, we match up against Erica and make clear to her that the game corner giving out unlimited TMs is definitely her problem or would be if Doppelbach didn't get fully paralyzed too many turns in a row, and she didn't carry potions, and didn't land a critical hit that brought poor Doppelbach down to one HP. Time for plan C. Dunkle can come in and with a few well-placed crits, takes out the entirety of Erica's team with Aerial Ace. Four badges down. Speaking of the game corner though, we find this shady person hanging on the back who immediately attacks us with a giant rat, so obviously we give chase. Below the casino is <gasps> an evil headquarters. Time to root out the boss. Giovanni is no pushover, unless you're a Mr. Mime named Porter and can sweep his entire team with Magical Leaf and Psybeam. Whoops. But hey, he left behind the Sylph scope, so now we can climb up into the Pokemon Tower where of course our rival is waiting for us again. Unfortunately for him, we're a little out of sequence as I'm pretty sure the game means for you to fight him before Erica, but I don't feel bad for steamrolling him here to be honest. Porter gives the old razzle dazzle and one shots Pidgeotto with a critical hit, takes out the incoming Gyarados just as easily, but then only manages to get a blight screen before falling asleep to Execute's Hypnosis. We then send out Dunkle and fight through the sleep to hit a few Fury Cutters, which I really expect to do more with a four times weakness after using it a few times, but I suppose sleep turns turn off the damage stacking of the move? I really don't know, but that's okay. Doppelbot can come in and quickly put the eggs on ice, and Kadabra meets the same chilly fate. Charmeleon also succumbs to Doppelbot supremacy after taking just two Thunderbolts. Remember, Porygon was designed by humans, of course it's a killing machine. On the higher floors of the tower, we pick up Ale the Cubone. Look at this little guy. After a quick exorcism, we rescue Mr. Fuji from the top of the tower, and he gives us the Poke Flute in exchange. This allows us to wake up the sleeping bear, blocking our path, and make our way to Fuchsia City. But not before evolving our little Ale into a beautiful Marowak. Once in Fuchsia, we can enter the Safari Zone, notoriously one of my least favorite places in all of Kanto, but we are allowed to catch a Rhyhorn of our own, eventually named Stout. We also get Surf and Strength here and get to pick up a new fishing rod in town, which means we can freely backtrack to a few cities and do some hunting for Hellas the Goldeen, who we quickly evolve. And we evolve Stout too. Koga is the next gym leader in our way. Kanto is a little weird with levels due to its open region design. Both Koga and Sabrina, the next two gym leaders, actually have the same level cap of 43. So while overleveling is technically allowed in this gym battle, anything that goes over level 43, I will not be able to use for Sabrina. I try to keep everyone under the cap just to be safe and only use the Pokemon I know I'll have to. In this case, Stout makes a strong lead by flinching Koga's coughing with Stomp and quickly taking it out the next turn. Muck falls in the same way, but not without me at least trying to get a KO in style with Horn Drill. The coughing takes two stomps before being flattened, and Weezing actually managed to dodge a couple of rock blasts, but when the second one connects, that's all that's needed to take out the toxic balloon. Speaking of Sabrina, we can't even challenge her gym yet because I forgot I hadn't yet cleared out the Sylphco. Honest answer, I had been playing Radical Red on stream the same days I was recording this, and it just so happened I played through Sylphco in that game on the same day I was taking on Koga and Sabrina in this run, so my brain just meshed the two together. But no matter. The place is crawling with grunts, but they're really no match for us. We also have another rival fight to go through, and at this point, I'm pretty damn convinced he's actually working with Team Rockets, so that's cool. His lead Pidgeot is no match for Rhydon, and I go for the crazy kill again and actually land the Horn Drill. <laughs> Sucker. Dunkle is able to take out Execute with Fly, and Hellas takes out Alakazam with two uses of Horn Attack. Against Gyarados, we send in Doppelbach, who can easily take any of its attacks, and one shot with Thunderbolt. Hellas is able to take center stage and set up Rain right in front of the scary Charizard. A boosted Surf is more than enough to take him out of the fight. At the top of Sylphco, who do we find other than the one and only Giovanni? Stout proves a useful lead once again, two-shotting the Nidorino. Against Nidoqueen, we switch in Hellas, set up the Rain, and Surf to Oblivion. Nidoqueen, Kangaskhan, and Rhyhorn all fall one right after another. With Team Rocket driven out of town for good, now we're free to tackle Sabrina. Unfortunately for her, we have Porter setting up a light screen, then an easy switch over to Dunkle. He makes good use of the increased bulk to set up a Swords Dance and sweep through her entire team with Slash and Fly. 
Close call on the Alakazam there, though. Jeez. Now it's time for my designated fishing break. This time in Cerulean, we fish up a Krabby named Pilsner. And while we're picking up team members, let's go ahead and pick up Saison the Tangela too. Now we can surf our way south of Pallet Town to Cinnabar Island and challenge Blaine for the seventh gym badge. We lead with Hellas, and I'm pretty sure you can tell where this is going. But in case you can't, rain dance, surf, surf, surf and surf. I'll also point out, I didn't even notice this until editing, but poor Hellas didn't even make it up to the level cap of 47. Whoops. Anyway, as soon as we exit the gym, we're confronted by Bill who wants to take us out on his boat. Stupid rich kids. Unfortunately, we actually have to say yes and take on his little side quest, purely so we can abandon him at the first opportunity and catch ourselves a Ponita named Marzen. You aren't allowed to leave the islands until you finish a few small quests, one of which involves taking all these bikers back to back to back, but considering all their Pokemon are still in the 30s, it really isn't much of an issue. Which means we get to skip ahead to our final gym leader battle against <gasps> Giovanni? Again? Time to pour out the Hella special. I mean, come on, we all knew this was coming. Look how much fun she's having, though. Before we reach the end game, we've got one spot on our board left to fill, so a quick stop with the Seafone Islands lands us a Psyduck, who we can evolve and trade with this weirdo for a Lickitung, which is now our Lickitung, and is therefore named IPA. According to our available encounters, we could also pick up a Ditto, which I think are in the mansion, but uh, yeah, for all our sakes, I'm just not counting that as an encounter anymore, because that's just not fun for anyone involved. Which means we have all our possible encounters going into the Elite Four, which is great. We level everyone up, evolve Pilsner and Marzen, and start making our way to the Elite Four. But wouldn't you know it, this prick has to stop us one last time. Legitimately didn't even know this fight was here, and actually it caught me off guard. But I'm glad I already did all my team leveling and prep beforehand. The Hell is Special takes out poor Pidgeot, and Execute, and Alakazam, and Rhyhorn. But we can't do much of anything to Gyarados, so we bring in the even bigger guns of Porter, easily eat two rain-boosted Hydro Pumps with a light screen, and one-shot the beast with a critical hit Psychic. We fire off two more Psychics into the incoming Charizard, and then play it safe by switching to IPA to stomp out the Flames of Rebellion as quickly as they were lit. Now it's time to really build the team, change moves, etc. But I know what you're thinking. I've got some pretty strong Pokemon like Rhydon and Porygon and Kingler. I'm definitely using those. Well, I've got some news for you. Since three of the encounters in these runs were trades, it gave me the impression that these trade exclusive Pokemon were just seen as awful Pokedex filler. And while that may be true, I was still determined to carry them to the very end. And along with them, I knew I just had to bring Tangela. Just look at the poor guy. Nobody's ever bringing that to the Elite Four. And that left me with just two filler options. So I took Hellas and Marzen. I brought Hellas for obvious reasons. I brought Marzen because of the remaining options options, she was the only one that I thought might really help me against Lorelei. And honestly, I think Rhydon might be a little too strong for this challenge. Our level cap is 60 to match Lance's ace. This will keep us below the highest level of the champion. This level cap was actually suggested to me by fellow creator Magnus, and frankly I think it's a great idea that fits really well on this kind of challenge. Lorelei is the first of the Elite Four, and she leads with a bulky dugong. So we lead off with Marzen and set up the sun which reduces the power of Surf and subsequently forces the Dugon to use Hail the next turn. Fortunately, we outspeed before that and can shoot off a powerful Solar Beam boosted by our Miracle Seed held item. Then when Lorelei tries to heal up the Ugly Cow, we set up the Sun once again. This back and forth continues until the Sun is up, a Solar Beam is fired, and a Flamethrower can finish it off. Cloyster comes in next, and what it lacks in special defense, it makes up for in physical, but that has no relevance here, and I don't know why I said it. It falls in a single Solar Beam. Once Lapras comes out, we bring in Porter to take the brunt of the beast. We try to set up a few Calm Mind boosts, but unfortunately, Porter hits himself twice in confusion and ends up paralyzed from Body Slam, so this isn't a strategy long for this world. We get off one Psychic, which keeps Lapras around half after eating its berry. Time to make use of Sizon, who can come in, take an Ice Beam even if super effective, and outspeed the next turn with a massive Giga Drain. It doesn't quite take out the Lapras, but it does heal enough to keep him out of KO range of another Ice Beam. We quickly KO the next turn. Slowbro doesn't quite fit the Icy vibe, but it does still have Ice Beam, so we switch Sizon out to IPA, and a couple spam Shadow Balls do the trick to fell the Hermit Hippo. Against Jinx, IPA stays in while trying to wake up from Slowbro's yawn, but to no avail. We switch in Hellas, set up the rain, and though she also falls asleep, we're able to tank resistant ice punches until we wake up and fire off a few boosted surfs to take out the Jinx. Next up is Bruno, and I've got a special plan for him. Sizon leads against his Onyx and promptly puts it to sleep with Sleep Powder. Now the fun begins. Double team! One, two, three, four, Sleep Powder! Five. Sleep Powder! Six. Sleep Powder! And now, Growth! One. Two. Three. Sleep Powder! Four. Sleep Powder! Five. Six. And finally, Sizon! Commence Draining! <laughs> anyway. 
Moving on, Agatha is a fun case. The ghost trainer that's really a poison trainer because Kanto has a lot of poison and not a lot of supernatural. But following that, Agatha's first Gengar has Shadow Punch and Confuse Ray, neither of which can affect IPA thanks to his normal typing and own tempo ability. So he's relatively free to spam Shadow Ball until Gengar falls. Then Golbite comes out and IPA is equipped with an Ice Beam to handle him as well. He's also carrying Earthquake for Arbok, but factoring in Intimidate, we go ahead and switch out anyway to Sizen. Honestly, because I thought for a second that he was Grass Poison like every other Grass type in Kanto, but whoops. And then back to IPA. Two quick Earthquakes does the trick. Now we have to make a real switch. So first we try Dunkle, but he gets put to sleep right away from Hypnosis and takes too much damage from Sludge Bomb. But Hellas can come in anyway, eat two Sludge Bombs easily, and knocks away most of Gengar's HP with Surf. Now we switch over to Porter, outspeed and quickly KO with a Psychic. Then the incoming Haunter meets the same fate and falls in just one hit. Lance is the last of the Elite Four, and Dragon-type trainers are pretty notoriously easy to handle if you have access to Ice Beam, but Lance is different. He doesn't actually have all dragons, and his team is actually kind of fun and mixed up. Well, at least a little bit. He leads off with a Gyarados. I'll admit, kind of weak to give this to both Lance and the rival, but whatever. Somebody could have fucked around and used a Golduck, guys. We lead again with Marzen, set up the sun, and three quick solar beams fell the beast. Once Aerodactyl comes in, Hellas meets him on the battlefield. She can easily take two ancient powers while setting up the rain, and then thanks to her swift swim, can outspeed and KO Aerodactyl with a boosted surf on the next turn. Lance's first Dragonair comes out next, so we bring an IPA and a few Ice Beams and full restores later, the Serpent Falls. We get to give the same treatment to his second Dragonair, and lastly we face off against his actual dragon, Dragon Knight. So we switch into Porter, who does actually survive a strong Hyper Beam. While Dragonite is forced to recharge, he can set up Reflect. Now we bring in Dunkle for free, thanks to Dragonite using Safeguard. Then Dunkle gets off a sword stance, but Outrage deals a lot more damage than I expected. Or, I mean, I shouldn't be surprised, but I was hoping Reflect would do some heavy lifting for this, I guess. Unfortunately, we'll have to make a sacrifice of Dunkle if we want a chance here to move on. We'll get as much damage in as we can with Slash, but... Oh, it's a critical hit, one hit KO. You did it, Dunkle, my boy. I couldn't be a more proud adoptive father. Wow. Frankly, other than Bruno, I'm surprised to get this far deathless with the Pokemon I brought, and now we're facing the champion. Let's see if we can keep it up. We decide to lead strong with Dunkle against our rival's Pidgeot. Sword Stance and Slash knock Pidgeot down to red, but he's restored the next turn. Unfortunately for him, a critical hit on Slash means it's all for naught, and Dunkle officially wins the bird fight. Against Rhydon, we switch in Hellas, and Surf makes quick work of him. Two down. With Executor in next, we can easily bring in Marzen, and even though he's put to sleep on the switch, we can stay in until he wakes up and one-shots the ugly Chew with Flamethrower. Now we're faced with the second Gyarados of the Elite Four. Guess they really don't have many options. Sizon misses the first sleep powder, but is bulky enough to take a few hits from Thrash while waiting to put the snake to sleep. Then we can bring in Porter, get up a few Calm Mind boosts, and take out the Gyarados with two hits of Psychic. Charizard comes out and also falls into uses of Psychic, and poor Alakazam can't do much of anything to Porter, who easily outbrains the Hungry Magician, and again, two shots with Psychic. Gary has no more Pokemon that can battle. Player defeated, Fire Red. This was pretty fun. Honestly, it made me really appreciate the difficulty increase of future games, small as it may be. But even more than that, it's what made me get back to playing more Radical Red. <laughs> this was definitely a shorter run and a shorter video because of it, but overall, I enjoyed the quick jaunt through Kanto to be able to add it to the series. I may even revisit it with a different list of encounters in the future. If you enjoyed this run, you might also enjoy some of the previous F tier runs I've done. You'll find some of them coming up on your screen, so go check them out. And if you have suggestions for future runs you'd like to see me try, leave a comment down below and let me know. As a reminder, I'm currently live streaming the XY F tier Nuzlocke right here on this channel, the first few streams of which you can already go and watch for yourself. They're linked in the description down below. If you want to catch the streams live, be sure to subscribe and turn on notifications or join my discord using the link in the description to be notified when I'm streaming. That's enough rambling from me. Thank you all so much for watching this video. I really, really do appreciate it. And I will catch y'all in the next run. See ya.